with me to Acts chapter number 18. So we're continuing our study this morning. This great story about the Acts of the early church. I want to start out this morning by making what I believe to be a statement of the obvious, but I want to make no assumptions. Anyone, and when I say anyone, I mean anyone, is capable of becoming discouraged and fearful. Anyone. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the faith. It doesn't matter how old or young. It doesn't matter your circumstance of life. Anyone, and I mean anyone, is capable of becoming discouraged and fearful. Don't think you can grow beyond it. That's not reasonable. Don't think you can forever avoid it because you won't be able to. And don't think it's just a sign of weakness or a sign of spiritual immaturity. It's a season and seasons that I think every last person who is alive goes through, and oftentimes, many times throughout life. As we'll see from this week's passage, friends, if this can happen to the Apostle Paul, if discouragement and fear can afflict the Apostle Paul, then I think it's pretty safe to say it can happen to any of us. Amen? The key to breakthrough is not avoiding it altogether, because I don't know if that's possible, but rather, when it does come to bear, it's bringing the God's gifts of grace to bear in fighting against it. And I think that's what we can see from this story in chapter number 18. And I'm going to just do what I've done many times through this book, and I'm going to read through the first 17 verses and kind of add some commentary to the story, because it's a really good story. And... Um, uh, it, uh, it begins with a transition in verse 1. Acts chapter number 18, beginning in verse 1. Luke writes this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, <laughs> let, me, let me stop right there because that's a short little sentence, but it, it says a whole lot. It means that he got up and he traveled 45 miles to the west by foot, which means that at this moment, in this journey, he would have traveled enough by foot, walking, so much so that he could have walked from Augusta, Georgia, to the Pacific Ocean in the last three chapters. It's something that's easy to miss when you're studying this story. 2,000 plus miles walking and probably another 1,000 miles added on top of that traveling by boat. All of it in, in the potential of danger everywhere and all of it because he had a passion to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Talking about convicting when I don't want to you know, open my mouth and walk next door or talk to the person <laughs> just across from me in, in a normal setting. And he literally walked from Georgia to the Pacific to tell people about Jesus. If anyone deserved to be blessed as a, by a consequence of his works, it was Paul. If it was anybody who deserved to never experience discouragement or fear based on their works, it would have been Paul. So it's impressive that he's done so much, but we're not saved by our works. And Paul's the first to announce that. And it's very true. Corinth was known in the ancient world for its entertainment especially in the form of sports, had a large amphitheater that was primarily for sports. But it was really known throughout the world at that time as being a depraved environment. It was, it was, it was 
known in their day as a slur, as, a, as an insult to look at somebody and tell them they're acting in a very Corinthian manner. It means that they're acting immorally or they're acting as if they're corrupt. You're acting like a Corinthian. And, and in, in this day, that was well known. And so when Paul went into this city, he went into a city that was known for its depravity. Yet while he was in this city, and he spent a fair amount of time there, this city was central in three of his longest letters that are recorded in the Scripture. He wrote First and Second Corinthians to them, and part of the reason why they're so long is because there's so many problems in the Corinthian church, because it is a depraved environment. And these people had a long way to be saved from. And so they struggled with some of their issues. It was very likely a large church as well because it was large enough to develop many factions. Paul said, some of you say you're of Paul. Some of you say you're of Apollos. Some of you say you're of Jesus. Some of you say this. Well, it's hard to get that many factions when you have three families. This was very likely a large church. And in addition to writing First and Second Corinthians to them, he wrote the book of Romans, the greatest treatise on the saving work of Christ that's ever been penned. He wrote that from Corinth during his time there. There's so much of the Bible that intermingles with the history of the book of Acts. Corinth was a major city in Paul's ministry, but I pray you can hear me when I say this. It almost wasn't. It was one of the major moments in Paul's ministry, but it almost wasn't. And this story puts that on display. Jumping back in in verse 2, it says that he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who'd recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, I often talk about the providence of God where God's hidden work behind the scenes, orchestrating events to bring out his purposes, comes to play. It's one of my favorite truths about who God is. But this couple is a prime example of the providence of God at work because Aquila and Priscilla got kicked out of Rome because they were Jews. And there was a Jew during that time named Christus who was causing, who was inspiring the Jews of, of the city of Rome to to rebel, and there was insurrections that took place. So Claudius, the emperor, just said, I want all of you to get out. Throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. And they got tossed out of Rome, and they had to go somewhere. Now, it's very likely that Aquila and Priscilla were thriving in Rome. They, they, had, they were living there by choice. They, they, were, they had a profession of tent making. It's very likely they were thriving there. And then, through no fault of their own, they weren't wrapped up in all this commotion. They got lumped together with all the troublemakers and thrown out. Now, in moments like that, it's so easy for us to look at the circumstances of life and say, God, do you not care what's happening to me? Do you not see what's happening to me? This is unjust, and you're letting unjust things happen in my life. They got kicked out and had to relocate because of nothing that they had done, but because of what somebody else had done. It has all the marks of injustice on it. But hear me, it was the providence of God. Because had that not happened, they would have not been in Corinth at the right moment, and they would have not come to know, very likely, the most significant friendship they were ever going to have in their life. You, it's so easy for us to judge the stuff of life and say, oh, this is horrible at the core. There's nothing good about this. But I wonder if God's not behind the scenes orchestrating events to put you in the right place at the right time, in the right frame of mind, with the right level of maturity so that you might receive something you might never otherwise have. We need to be so careful when we look at the stuff of life and and condemn it, because I'm sure this wasn't a happy thing for them in the moment, but nonetheless, it was something that God used in their life in a profound way. Verse 2 continues, and he, that is Paul, went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, they were tent makers, he stayed with them and worked 
for they were tent makers by trade. That primarily means he was a leather worker. Uh, he made tents, very likely made sails, just about anything you can make out of leather. Um, and, and when you see providence, what you see here is that God provided to believers, committed believers, to work with Paul in his chosen profession so that he might earn a living during a season when he had to make tents, when he had to work with leather. And, and, and it, it's so easy to gloss over this, but, but what a blessing is it to be able to work with people of like precious faith. Now, even though he made a living by tent making, I want you to hear clearly that was not his primary purpose. It's one of the great mistakes that many of us make is we try and find our real purpose, our ultimate purpose in what we do. He made tents so that he could eat, but his purpose was much higher. And it's described in verse four. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. That was his purpose. His primary act was just like the primary act of everybody else in the book of Acts, and that was sharing the good news of who Jesus was. And, and he tried to persuade. That's the key verse there, or the key phrase in that verse. He tried to persuade. It implies that regardless of his effort, he had not had much success. And we'll see the fruit of that in just a minute. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, if you'll remember, he left them behind when he had to flee one of the cities. And so they stayed behind and ministered to the church after he left. But they're rejoining him now. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. That word occupied in the ESV carries the sense that he was actually acted upon by the word. It doesn't mean that he filled his, he, it, it wasn't just disciplined study, but rather it was that the word had an effect on him of capturing his, pet, of his passions. The word obsessed him. He became wholly engrossed by the word because the word had an effect on him. It wasn't him just making himself study. It was the word capturing him. This was likely because Paul or because Silas and Timothy brought fun, funds from the churches that they had come from so that he didn't have to make tents anymore. And then jumping in at verse 6, and when they opposed and reviled him, this is the Jews in the synagogue, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your hands, or your heads, I'm innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. Now, this is a statement and a moment of incredible frustration. When you think of all that he's gone through to this point, he goes into a town, people come to Christ, the Jews rise up against him. He goes into another town, he shares the gospel, does signs and wonders, people rise up against him and drive him out of that town. And he's had to bounce from one place to another. And finally, he's come to a place where I think he's had all he can stand. That he's just fed up. Now, I'm not going to look at that and say that that was a righteous response. I don't know. Luke doesn't actually say one way or another whether or not that was a flesh flash or that was him having a righteous indignation response. Uh, what we do know is this, when, when he says, I'm shaking the dust off, that's very similar. You remember Jesus said, when they don't receive you, you just shake the dust off your feet. Well, you only did that shaking the dust off your feet thing when you were outside. Etiquette demanded that if you're inside, you actually said, I'm shaking the dust off my garments because you don't take your shoes off. You're not wearing them when you're inside. Your blood be on your own hands, which is a statement back from Ezekiel when, when, when Ezekiel shared warnings, God told him if they don't listen to you, the blood's, their blood's on their head. It's basically Paul saying, I am done with you. Now here's the, here's the caution that I want to give everybody in this room. And the reason that I'm saying, I don't know if this was a right response or not, Luke actually doesn't say, is if you get angry and just decide you're going to look at somebody and say, well, you can just go to, for all I care, because I'm not going to mess with you anymore. Y'all hear me, hear me, hear me. 
Everybody got to hear me. You got to know you're hearing God if you're going to do that. If you make up your mind, you're going to write somebody off and say, well, they're just, they're not elect. I know it. I'm not even going to mess with, I'm not going to waste any of my time or energy on them. I'm writing them off totally. Hear me, friends. That is a serious thing. To, the, to, to my knowledge from the story as it's written, Paul never went back to the synagogue again. He left and he was serious. I'm done. And if we want to assume that he was right in doing that, then, then, then hear me. If you ever find yourself tempted to do that, you better know you're right. I don't think this is something to be emulated. I do think it's a sign that he was discouraged. And one of the ways that discouragement manifests itself is in anger. He looked at these people and he said, I'm done with you. And then in verse 7, he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And his, you know, that's, a, that's a Roman name, so it means he probably wasn't a Jew, but he lived next door to the synagogue. His house was next door to the synagogue. So this is what happened. Paul got mad and planted a church. This man could have been a Baptist. He planted a church right next door to the synagogue. I just think of the moments when, you know, there were more cars in his parking lot than there was in the synagogues, and the people at the synagogue got mad. That's figurative. There weren't cars back then, you understand. But, but he, he planted a church right next door with a Gentile who had come to Christ And then in the aftermath, some things started happening. Crispus, verse 8, the ruler of the synagogue. Now, ruler of the synagogue does not mean that he was the rabbi. He wasn't the pastor of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue was really somebody that was more uh, engaged and employed to take care of the synagogue building itself and make sure that everything was prepared for the ceremonies. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians hearing Paul's gospel, Paul believed and were baptized. So when, when he shakes his coat off and says, I'm done with y'all, the next thing we find out is the person that's in charge of the synagogue building actually comes to Christ and his whole family comes to Christ and gets baptized. And then all of a sudden, many more are coming along with him. But in spite of this apparent success that Paul was having, I think he was still struggling. The reason I think that is because of the dramatic thing that happens next. Paul's Corinthian night vision, where Jesus actually appeared to him and spoke to him. And if you think God doesn't do things like this, then I pray that you would, you would revisit that in your heart. Because the truth is, God does speak to his children. He does sometimes in very dramatic ways. This was dramatic. And the Lord, if you're reading the ESV and you have a red letter edition, then what's about to come up is actually in red because of a reference to Jesus. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. That word vision means he saw it with his natural eyes. This is pretty dramatic. But look at what Jesus said. Do not be afraid. I think that it's more than just an implication there. Jesus wasn't looking him and telling him, reminding him to not be afraid just out of the blue. I think that he was looking at him and saying that to him very specifically because he had an internal struggle right now with fear. These Jews who had been rising up and trying to kill him in other cities apparently are starting to get inflamed here. He hadn't done nothing to help it. He planted a church right next door to the synagogue. And he probably was having moments in the night. Does your mind run amuck at night sometimes? He had a moment one night where maybe fear was starting to get a grip on him. And maybe what he was doing 
was to plan on doing what he'd done in every other city. When the Jews really got fierce and they were threatening him, he left and went to the next city. That was his pattern. Not criticizing that, I think it was wisdom. But I think it's very likely that he was planning on doing the exact same thing here. That he was starting to fear what the Jews might do to him, and so he's making it, he's plotting his exit one night. And then Jesus appears, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I'm with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Can't you just imagine he was like the prophet saying, nobody's, nobody's for you, Lord. And God responds back, I do have people. You just don't know who they are yet. Now, here's the interesting thing. Right there, since, since Paul had not evangelized them yet, it's very likely that God was describing people who had not yet believed, yet who he had his hand on to bring to Christ. He said, I have people in this city who will come to Christ. You just need to not be scared. You need to not uh, stop talking. You need to be careful that you don't become silent. There are people here who will hear you can't, fe- you can't fail unless you just stop. So Jesus appeared right on the verge of, I think, Paul abandoning this town and going to the next. Like I told you before, this is one of the greatest churches that Paul ministered in. Probably one of the larger ones, very significant in the New Testament. And it almost didn't happen. I think he was plotting his way out. And then Jesus showed up and said, no, you need to stay. He appeared to him and said, don't be afraid, go on speaking, and assured him that no one would harm him. But that wasn't a promise that no one would try. He said, no one will attack you to harm you. That's a promise you have. But hear me again when I say this. That was a promise he had in Corinth. Later on, he would go to different places, and stuff was going to happen. But in this moment, Jesus appeared and said, no one's going to attack you to harm you. They might try, but they're not going to harm you. And I want you to stay. And so he did. He stayed a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. And now I want you to look at how God protected him. This is just great. If you've got, you got anything in you whatsoever in your flesh that tends towards spitefulness, you're going to love this. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. Gallio, proconsul of Achaia, means that he was the big dog over a bunch of governors. And they brought him before this guy saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Now, that is not, they're not referencing the Jewish law. They're referencing Roman law. They're coming before him and they're saying, hey, listen, this guy is breaking Roman law. Now, if Gallio had found fault in Paul, he would have sentenced him to something. It would have set a precedent and it would have called it would have called, caused Christian ministry to be hampered all over the Roman world. Every governor under him would have followed this edict. This was a huge moment. And the Jews were trying to shut not only Paul up, but the whole of the faith. Verse 14, but when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, Paul didn't even get to, get to give his defense. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crimes, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. He looked and he said, I ain't getting in the midst of your your religious squabble. Proverbs 21.1 says this, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. In this moment, even without Paul giving a defense, 
Gallio chimes in and he says, I don't want anything to do with this. And verse 16 says, and he, that is Gallio, drove them, that is the Jews, from the tribunal. And they, we don't know who they is. It could have been the other Jews. It could have been the crowd that gathered. But they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. And they beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. He didn't really care what was going on because it was just Jew on Jew crime. But like I said, if you've got any spitefulness in you at all, you're going to love this. Because here's what just happened. This guy, along with others, brought Paul because he wanted Paul to be beaten in front of the tribunal. And then without Paul opening his mouth, Gallio turned it around so much so that his accuser wound up getting beaten in public in front of the tribunal. I will tell you, if I was Paul, I would have been like, Pfft. <laughs> didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, again, I don't know if that had been a righteous response, but I know the flesh I'm made out of. I'd have struggled not to gloat in that moment. Y'all, I think this is a great story. But in it, I see Paul battling through discouragement and fear and eventually finding victory. And if you think that somebody like Paul is not capable of, of experiencing discouragement and fear, then then I don't, I don't think you understand the humanity of him. He had a flesh flash. He had a moment where I think he was preparing to abandon a work that God intended him to stay at for a while. And God intervened in a number of different ways and gave him what I would consider grace gifts that helped him make it through discouragement and fear. And here's the deal. I think they'll help you through discouragement and fear as well. They have helped me through discouragement and fear. And so I, I want to spend a little bit of time identifying them. these things that I believe the Scripture points out as God's gifts for the battle against discouragement and fear. They won't prevent it from happening, but they'll cure it and they'll, they'll defend against it once it does come. And the first and most obvious for me in this story is one of God's great gifts against discouragement and fear is friends. And when I say that, I mean friends who are in the faith. I mean friends who share a like precious faith. If you have a friend that is really close to you and you do depraved stuff with that friend, that is not who I'm talking about. All right, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, don't be deceived. The reason Paul said that is because it's so easy for us to be deceived. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And if you think you can be around the wrong kind of people on a consistent basis and they will not rub off on you, Paul would say to you, don't be deceived. You will become around those people that you're around. The, you will become like those people you're around the most. They will rub off on you. You say, no, I'm going to rub off on them. Don't be deceived. You know what deceived people have in common? They don't know they're deceived. Because if they knew they were deceived, they wouldn't be deceived anymore. You say, oh, no, I can be around these people, and they won't rub off. Don't be deceived. What Paul had here was not just friends. He had gospel-loving, Jesus-loving, gospel-announcing friends who were co-laborers in ministry with him. The first that's mentioned is Aquila and Priscilla. From all, from all the descriptions, these are not people in the five-fold ministry. I don't love the term layman, but they were, they, they, they were people who were not pursuing vocational ministry. It's not mentioned that they're teachers. It's not mentioned that they're evangelists. It's not mentioned that they're prophets or apostles or pastors. They're just, they're just quality Jesus-loving folk who are living their life pursuing God's purposes. These are the kind of people that every pastor wants in their church. And I'm grateful for the Aquilas and Priscillas that I have at Grace Fellowship here. And you should be too. If you know those people, you need to go thank them. 
Uh, don't, don't, don't let encouraging people be like the housework and only point stuff out when it's not being done. Instead, if you see somebody that's just doing stuff to make the ministry of the church better, go and encourage them. They need encouragement. But Aquila and Priscilla are these kind of people. They supported Paul. They worked with him. They gave him a place to live. He lived with him while he was in Corinth. And that meant that whether it was working or whether it was having a place to live while he pursued ministry, he was not alone in Corinth as long as he had friends in Aquila and Priscilla. Eventually, when this couple returned to Rome, because the the edict from Claudius never, you know, historically never got lifted, but apparently it stopped being enforced because Jews eventually went back to Rome. And they went back and went back to their home there. They're likely the couple that delivered the book of Romans to the Roman church. And I want you to listen to what Paul writes in Romans in chapter number 16, verses 3 and 4. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. What these people did was for me and for everybody. Having friends like this made a difference for Paul. He had friends in Silas and Timothy who were his traveling companions from the beginning of this journey. And even though they had, by his direction, stayed in some various places, when they arrived back in Corinth to be reunited with him, he was immediately emboldened and became more focused. Silas and Timothy were an encouragement to him. Silas, this traveling companion, and Timothy, who would become his godson. And though they're not mentioned specifically, I believe the other churches brought encouragement to Paul as well. Because when Silas and Timothy showed up, they likely had stories of how the churches were doing, how they were growing, and they likely carried with them gifts, which is why the tent making is not mentioned anymore after Timothy and Silas show up. That provision that was brought from other believers as a gift of encouragement to Paul so that he could focus on ministry was a display of love that basically said, Paul, we believe in what you're doing and we want you to be focused on it. He was blessed by the places that he'd ministered at. He was blessed by people such as Titius Justus who opened his home and gave Paul a place to meet for over a year maybe as much as a year and a half. Paul had friends, and I think those friends were God's gifts to him to battle against discouragement and fear. What would we do without friends? We need godly people around us that will speak the gospel-centered truth to us in our times of need. And here's my experience. You judge your own. The bigger the problem I have, the more friends I need. I've had struck. Listen, I have a big family. I just joked about not having enough room at the. I mean, I've got a big old table. It's not fancy, but I I I bought a conference table out of a business that was going out of you know place that was going out of business years ago. It's ugly. That's why we put a you know a, a blanket over it kind of thing. And so, but it's huge. And put ten chairs around it. And you know, I'm, I'm all of a sudden I don't have enough room around the table. People are having to sit in each other's laps. We're having to, I don't have the elbow room that I want and need. We're going to have to start having a kid's table. I, I, I'm saying all this to say, I got a big family. Here's a, and, and it's great having a big family. I love it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, don't misunderstand me saying anything bad about it. I'm all for it. Um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to death that my tribe is increasing. But here's the thing about family. And that is when I'm going something, going through something, it's very likely that they're going through it too. And I know that can drive you and cause you to help one another and you bear one another's burdens, but I have had significant struggles in my life where my kids were just as wounded as I was. And we needed more than just to depend on each other. We needed the extended body of Christ to minister into our lives. I, I'm all about family, and it's important, but it's not enough. 
If it was enough, then God would have told you to, told you to you know, just lock your door. Instead, he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And the biggest struggles that I've had in life demanded that I have many people who are there for me. They don't have to be there all the time, but the, 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 the friends that I have that are sometimes scattered out throughout this country and sometimes right here locally in, in this body came in in moments of need when I needed a word of encouragement, when I needed somebody to hold my arms up, when I needed somebody to pat me on the back, when I needed somebody to speak a gospel truth in my life. And I'm grateful that my family has been there to do that, but I have a bigger family than just that. And I really don't know what we do without friends. We're not called to do this thing alone. Brothers and sisters in the faith are one of God's greatest gifts that he's given us to protect us from wallowing in discouragement and fear. Because discouragement and fear, one of the things that they do is they try to isolate us. They try and separate us off. When someone gets bound up in these things, very often their fleshly inclination is to actually run from the church. When well, the more expedient thing to do is to run to the church, to run to those people who love the Lord like you do, who share a like precious faith. You say, I don't have any friends like that. Show yourself to be friendly. I don't want to turn this too much into personal testimony, but I will say this. There was a season in my life where I felt very abused by the church. And it was during that season that I longed to have friends, but I was not going to make the first move because I was not going to get hurt again. And I was also not going to um, uh, be overly open, you know, if somebody approached me, I was going to be like, okay, I'm going to judge you for a fair amount. And, and I don't know that my attitude was right at all during that time, but this is what I do know, that when people did try to befriend me, I had this look on my faith that said, I don't have anything, I don't want anything to do with you. Somebody try and talk to me, and I'd think, they're just trying to find something out about me. I'm not going to tell them anything. People come up, interested in what's going on in my life. Good people, godly people who love Jesus. And I'd look back at them and I'd say, okay. I was closed off from discouragement and fear, and as a consequence, it caused me to appear very unfriendly. And unless somebody had a word from God that they needed to break through in my life, I was an easy person to look at and say, well, they just don't need anybody. They definitely don't want anybody. They think they don't need anybody. And unintentionally, I became a very unfriendly person. I hit it, though. Again, personal testimony. I hit it. I said things like, I'm an introvert. Which means I don't have to talk to you, and so I'm not going to unless I want to. Listen, I'm perfectly all right with my own company most of the time. But there are times that my own company simply isn't enough. You say, but I'm not outgoing. I'm not gregarious. Okay, well, let's stop making it about you. Maybe there's somebody else in this body that needs you as a friend. And if all you can do is say, well, that's just not who I am as a person. What if that's what they need as a person? Hear me, friends. I pray, you, I pray you're able to hear that, that this is one of God's great gifts when it comes to battling discouragement and fear is having a friend, a bunch of friends who will speak truth into your life and offer encouragement to you. And the bigger the problem, the more you have need of them. Family's great, but no man is a failure who has friends. And so one of the great gifts is friends. But one of the other great gifts that 
Paul, that is highlighted in Paul's story, is one of the great promises of the Scripture. When Jesus appeared to Paul, one of the things he did was to restate his very last promise that he gave to the disciples before he ascended. He said, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Heard the corny joke once, I think from Herb Hodges initially, that lo, I'm with you always, which means that's why you don't fly. But, but I'm with you always. This is Jesus declaring a fact that he was going to be more than just present. I pray you can hear this distinction. That he was going to be more than just present. He was going to be a presence in Paul's life. Some of you have had relationships. Maybe you've had a parent or, or people around your life who were present but while they were around you, they just checked out. Jesus is not just saying, I'm going to be there. He's saying, I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be fully engaged in everything that's going on in your life. That he, in his power, would bring to bear all of the authority that was given him by the Father so that God's purposes might be fulfilled in Paul's life. He said, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be at work. I'm going to be there. And I'm going to make sure that nothing happens to you that doesn't further God's purposes in you and in this world and doesn't bring glory to my Father. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be the help you need in times of real struggle. I'm going to be there when you're scared to let you know you are never alone. I pray you can hear this. Once you're in Christ, there is no more alone. Now, I have felt alone, but my feelings will lie to me. If my stomach's a little upset, my feelings will lie. If I don't get enough sleep, my feelings will lie. If I hear the wrong song on the radio, my feelings will lie to me. But Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And it is hard to be scared with Jesus at your right hand. Anytime I've been, in, been paralyzed by fear, I can say I haven't recognized a presence of God around my life because I get so hyper-focused on the fear that I have. You see that light right there? I stood on top of a 16-foot ladder. Don't do this, by the way. I stood on top of a 16-foot ladder with nothing to hold on to but air so that that thing would be on a shorter pole than all the rest of the lights in the room so it wouldn't cast a shadow on that screen while you're looking at the words. I will never do it again. I think the Lord has told me I never have to do anything like that again. The reason I did it is because Wade was going to do it, and I didn't want to watch him die. I mean, he was... He was flying up the ladder. We're all standing around looking at each other. And he said, I'll do it. And I was like, no, no, I can't watch my pastor die. And so I climbed up there. I don't know, I thought maybe I'd bounce better than he would, huh? Okay, that was, can I hear, let me just say when I, that was prime time stupid. But in the midst of me even doing something prime time stupid, when I was terrified in the midst of it, I was shaking the whole time. He was there. My time was not yet. Now, I don't want to test that all the time. Please hear me when I'm saying this. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But my time was not yet. He would have made it just fine if he'd have tried it. Because his time was not yet. Hear me when I say this, friends. When Jesus said, I am with you, it means that there is nothing going to befall you except that which God purposes to bring glory to his name and good ultimately to you. 
And if it hurts you a little bit along the way, if it's struggle along the way, I mean, he got carried to court. And let's not forget that somewhere down the road, he got beheaded. But it's Jesus making a declaration that in all the struggles of life, know this, I am here. And nothing is going to happen to you except that my power intervenes and makes it so that it is for your good and his glory. He is there. You say, I don't feel his presence. I don't care what your feelings say. I trust his promise more than your feelings. I trust his promise more than my feelings. You say, well, I'm terrified about something. I'm scared about this happening. I'm scared about that happening. Hear the promise. I'm with you. I wish you could hear the way I hear in my spirit and the way it gets settled because I hear it all the time. The Lord speaking, I've got this. As I'm seemingly paralyzed by, I wouldn't call it fear because, you know, I'm a man. I would call it, not even worry because that's got negative, con I would call it concern. As I lay awake at night and hypothesize every possible scenario of how I'm going to deal with a circumstance. And in the midst of those moments when it's concern or fear or worry, I can tell you that what I'm not thinking is Jesus is here and his very presence means that he's got this. I can tell you that when my mind refocuses to that, it brings calmness to my spirit. I believe his promise of his presence is one of the great gifts that God gave Paul, but also to all of us that is meant to battle discouragement and fear. It's a great promise. It's a gospel promise because he made a choice to love us. He made a choice to forgive us. He made a choice to be with us. And that choice was based on who he was, not on who we are. So I'm grateful that he gave me in grace friends and that he gave me in grace promises. But finally, I'm grateful that he gave me purpose. Here's a fact. Inactivity only enshrines fear. It never eases it and it never eradicates it. That's good truth right there. Inactivity only enshrines fear. It never eases it. It will never eradicate it. And the enemy tends and intends to paralyze us in fear. The enemy wanted Paul to shut up. But I've found this to be true. The stuff of life, and I mean the stuff of life that we all go through, the struggles that exist for all of us. The stuff of life just isn't worth it without a purpose bigger than ourselves. My own personal comfort is not a hill worth dying on. A little more stuff is not a hill worth dying on. I'm just telling you, I've got a nice TV. I love that TV. If my house is burning down, I ain't running in the house to grab it. It's not worth dying for. The only thing I believe in the heart of any person who's been truly changed by the grace of God is to recognize that his purposes are the only thing big enough that makes it worth going through the stuff of life for. And the gospel proclamation was something that was worth Paul's life. Jesus looked at him and he said, don't be afraid and don't be quiet. Keep speaking the gospel. Keep speaking truth. We're designed by God to be a living, breathing, constant testimony of God's goodness through Christ in this world. And if you'll let them, discouragement and fear will shut your mouth. 
but seeing your purposes as much bigger than what's the, the circumstances that, you in, that you're in. And seeing that you've been created to be an ambassador of good news is incredibly freeing. Because some of the places that you can share good news the best are when stuff's really bad. I mean, what a loud witness when Paul and Silas are beaten and laying in jail, but they wake up and they start singing hymns to the glory of God. And, Courtney, and, and, and that, that jailer, that Philippian jailer and his whole family comes to Christ as a consequence. You want to find purpose in whatever you're going through. Recognize that that purpose is much bigger than just you. It's the fact that God has made you to be a part of the great unfolding drama of redemption. That he has determined that even though he's powerful enough to spread good news without our help, he's dedicated himself to include us in it. That he's made you to be a vital part. And that's good news in itself. So I pray that you're able to hear today. I believe Paul experienced a season of discouragement and fear. I believe he was on the verge of abandoning his post in Corinth and going to the next place when God had bigger purposes in mind. And one of the th some of the things that God used in his life to deliver him were good gospel friends. Do you have good gospel friends? Friends who will speak good news to you. Friends who share a like precious faith. Friends who won't make fun of you because you're growing in Christ, but instead will inspire you to grow even more. Do you have them? You say, are you saying that I should ditch my old friends? You won't have to, friend. Hear me when I say this. If you make up your mind that you're not going to participate with them in the sinful stuff, you won't have to leave them. You say, I can't really go to the bar with you, but we can go to church. Hey, let's do this thing that's kind of, you know, nasty and depraved. It's like, no, nah, well, hey, we're having a Bible study. It's like, don't you want to do this anymore? Well, I do, but what I really want to do is glorify God with my life because of everything he did for me through Christ. And they'll either get saved or get lost. But do you have some good gospel friends? You say, if you can say, I don't, then ask God to give them to you. I think, it's, I think it's a part of what he intends the body to be. And I just encourage you, show yourself to be friendly. Make sure your face is communicating that, by the way, because right now some of you are looking at me like, you know, you hate my guts. You know, that resting face. That says, I am not a friendly person, so don't try and talk to me. <laughs> Be friendly. And I believe God will, I believe that, that someone who's friendly and loves Jesus attracts people who are friendly and love Jesus. And I think the day will come when you will have plenty of gospel friends. Do you trust in the promise that he's with you, or do you think you're in this by yourself? I am so grateful that... I'm able to cast my cares upon him, and he cares affectionately for me. He is more than just present. He is a presence. Are you making a decision that you're going to live on purpose? That, that whatever you might be going through, that doing the primary work of the, gospel, of, 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 of the early church, the primary act of sharing good news, are you making that your purpose? Are you being an ambassador for him in the world around you? If you find a, pur a purpose bigger than yourself, it'll take your eyes off the circumstances. I think these things are vitally important. I don't think these things eliminate the struggle that often comes with discouragement and fear, but I think they are some of God's great gifts in breaking through it. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Lord, I've got any brothers and sisters in this room that are in the thick of it. I mean, thick of struggle. They're struggling. Discouragement setting in. Maybe they've even had some flesh flashes because that's how they're responding. Or fear has come in and they're 
like Paul, he was, he was scared he was going to get hurt. He was scared that, that, um, that these Jews were finally going to succeed and kill him. He even wrote to the Thessalonians that they needed to be in prayer for him. During this season, I, I, I pray that fear has got a hold of anybody. That you would begin a work of grace in them right now to deliver them from it. I pray that even in this moment, you'd put it on some hearts of people around them to go speak a word of encouragement. Lord, your sheep hear your voice. There are people in this room who can hear the voice of God directing them to go encourage somebody, whether they know a situation or not. So I pray that you would. I pray that the gifts of the Spirit would be released in this body right now so that the saints of God might encourage one another, that we would have the friends and be the friends. That's necessary. And, and Lord, I, I know you're present, but would you make your presence known? Give them an ass assurance that your faithfulness to be with them is based on who you are and not who they are. And I pray that even in the midst of it, they'd hear that command that you gave Paul, don't be silent. Don't let discouragement or fear shut you up. Don't let the enemy win. But instead, be a proclaimer of good news. I know that so many often hear better when we make that good confession in the midst of struggle. But Lord, use this. Use whatever means. But I pray, my brothers and sisters who are in the midst of battle, I don't want them to feel bad about it. Paul can go through it. Anybody can go through it. But Lord, would you deliver us by the grace that we're being offered today for our good and for your glory? Let's all stand together. If our ministry teams would come.